so what about Jane? Jane actually did write the story of her life. I found it, this little book of 16 pages, I found it, it's here in an archive in Boston, and I held it in my hands. Here's uh, a page from it. It is so small, it is so humble, and it is so plain. She called it her book of ages. It isn't really an autobiography, it's a list of the births and deaths of her children. It's a litany of grief. It is a record in brief of a life lived rags to rags. 16 pages, and as I turned them, I discovered that most of the pages were blank. You finally have a book, you have a pen, you have a long life, and she did not write much down. Old South Meeting House is a great place to have a program, program like this. Uh, we know this building best because of the role that it played as the starting place for the Tea Party, um, but this wasn't just a gathering place for politics, for the boisterous popular politics that helped to drive Boston toward revolution during the 1760s and the 1770s. This building, of course, was first built in 1729 as a church, as a place of worship, and for many, many people in Boston during the revolutionary era, this was a center of worship, and it was also a center of community life. So as you sit in your seats um, here on the floor and in the balcony today, I want you to think about the fact that you're sitting where they sat, and you're sharing the experience that they had of having to bend your life around the great political changes taking place all around us. So we are bound to the revolutionary generation. <clears throat> We're bound because we still grapple with a set of questions they gave us, but we are also bound by our common experience as human beings. So please keep that in mind. Uh, I'm going to turn this over to our friends from the ART. When we decided to stage a new production of 1776, Jill Lepore was one of the very first people we reached out to, and her insights, and especially her extraordinary book, These Truths, A History of the United States, have already had an impact on our thinking about the production. Jill is the David Woods Kemper Professor of American History at Harvard University, and is also a staff writer at The New Yorker. Her latest book is This America, The Case for the Nation, her 2018 book, These Truths, is an international bestseller and was named one of Time Magazine's top 10 nonfiction books of the decade. Her next book, If Then, How the Simulmatics Corporation Invented the Future, will be published in 2020. She is also the author of numerous other books, including The Whiteness of Their Eyes, The Tea Party's Revolution and the Battle over American History, The Secret History of Wonder Woman, and Book of Ages, The Life and Opinions of Jane Franklin, which we will hear more about shortly. This evening, Jill will be telling the story of Benjamin Franklin's long forgotten sister, Jane, and meditating on what it means to write history, not from what can be found, but from what has been lost. The story feels particularly appropriate to share tonight here in the Old South Meeting House, directly across from the site of the Franklin's family home and on the day before Benjamin Franklin's birthday. So I'd like to end by thanking the staff at the Old South Meeting House who have helped with this evening's event, and especially thank you all for joining us here tonight. And now it is my great pleasure to welcome Professor Jill Lepore. I'm gonna tell you the story of Jane Franklin. I was, <laughs> was getting ready to come here this evening, and I realized I probably haven't said a word about Jane Franklin in nine years or some very long time. Um, so uh, I'm going to do my best to remember what I know about Jane Franklin, <laughs> which means that I may read more than I'm used to reading when I, when I talk. I like to usually just gab, but I've kind of forgotten everything. Um, so again, I just want to say thanks to the Old South Meeting House for welcoming all of us to this beautiful and indeed sacred space, uh, and to thank the American Repertory Theater for all that they do uh, in Cambridge and in Boston, uh, and for the arts uh, uh, in, uh, much in a much wider ambit as well. In 1771, Benjamin Franklin sent his sister Jane a pair of spectacles. 
Or rather, he sent her 13 pairs of spectacles with lenses of every size from 1 to 13. And then he sent her instructions for, con for uh, conducting her own eye exam. You know that thing when you go to get an eye exam? I'm looking around at all the people with glasses. And they put that horrible thing over your face, and it's like you're in a virtual reality thing. And they do, which is better, A or B, A or B? They do that thing. And you're like, the same? Like, it's always, doesn't it always feel like it's a trick question? Like, I, I can never tell the difference. Like, so I, I have a great deal of anxiety about this, but there weren't, you couldn't, you, that's not how you got your glasses fitted. You would buy a whole box of lenses uh, at the time, and it was extraordinary expense, but this was a gift that Benjamin sent to Jane here in Boston. And you would do your own eye exam, and it was okay to have the whole set, because you figured you'd go through them as you, <laughs> right? And you would. Take out a pair at a time and hold one of the glasses first against one eye and then against the other, looking on some small print. If the first pair suits neither eye, put them up again before you open a second. I advise you trying each of your eyes separately because few people's eyes are fellows. What does it mean to be one of a pair? Benjamin Franklin was born just steps from this building here in Boston in 1706. His sister Jane, was born here six years later. Uh, this is from a Franklin family record book chronicling their births. Benny was the youngest of 10 sons. Jenny was the youngest of seven daughters. Benny and Jenny, they were called when they were little, and no two people in their family were more alike. Jane thought of her brother as her second self. They were considered within their family to be twins, like a pair of eyes. They pose, though, a biographical dilemma, because their lives could hardly have been more different. Benjamin Franklin ran away from here, from Boston, from home when he was 17. Jane never left. He taught himself to write with wit and force and style. She never learned to spell. The day he turned 21, he wrote her a letter. She was 14, beginning a correspondence that would last until his death, 63 years later. He became a printer, a philosopher, and a statesman. She became a wife a mother, and a widow. He signed the Declaration of Independence, the Treaty of Paris, and the US Constitution. She strained to form the letters of her name. He loved no one longer. She loved no one better. Benjamin Franklin wrote more letters to his sister Jane than he wrote to anyone else. All her life, she wrote back, letter after letter filled with news and recipes and gossip. And when she was truly, sorely vexed, and only then, with her blistering opinions, about the revolutionary politics here in Boston. Benjamin Franklin, of course, famously wrote the story of his life, a well-turned tale about a boy who runs away from a life of poverty and obscurity in cramped, pious Boston and leaves all that behind. When he ran away, he left his home behind, he left his sister behind, he left ignorance behind, he left the past behind to become an enlightened, independent man of the world, a man of books, a man of learning, a man of science, a man of papers, a man of letters, a man of power, a man who could be a star in the musical 1776. <laughs> Benjamin Franklin became a spectacle. 1771, the year he sent his sister spectacles, is also the year he began writing his autobiography. It wasn't published until after his death in 1790, but Franklin's autobiography is one of the most important autobiographies ever written. It helped invent the word autobiography, which wasn't coined until 1797. It was also meant as an allegory about America, the story of a man as the story of a nation, self-made, rags to riches, a runaway, a rebel, a revolutionary, the story of America. In that story, he left his sister entirely out. He never so once has mentioned her name. Where does that leave her story? One half the world doesn't know how the other half lives, Franklin once wrote. But his sister is his other half. And if his life is an allegory, so is hers. But then what is it an allegory for? What does the story of Jane Franklin's life tell us? Her life wasn't a spectacle. It's very difficult even to see her life. Against his life, his larger than life life, her life is tiny. He's a spectacle, she's a speck. No portrait of Jane Franklin survives. She can't be seen in the way we see him. There are, of course, dozens of portraits of Franklin, her brother. He liked 
to be depicted as often as possible wearing his eyeglasses, which is a strange thing. It, spectacles were really new in the 18th century. You would wear them to read, but there was really no other reason to, to, to wear spectacles. They were a symbol of your learning, uh, of your capacity and your dedication to the study of books. But to wear them outside on the street, Franklin was like the only person in the whole of the 18th century who did that. It was as if, it was as if he were walking around with a toothbrush hanging out of his mouth. <laughs> Like, people just did, there's no one else who is painted, really, wearing their glasses before Franklin is, except for painters. And painters had themselves painted with their, they did self-portraits wearing glasses to show that they could see right through you. It was, eyeglasses in, in portraits are a really important signifier of a certain kind of learning, a certain kind of vision. Remember, uh, thinking about the novelty of eyeglasses, um, that Eyeglasses as a consumer item were really relatively new. They really only uh, appear beginning in the 1640s. And then there are these things that are called uh, nose spectacles. This is my favorite. This is Richard Mather, of Do the pastor of Dorchester from 1670. Can you see his eyeglasses in this portrait? Do you see the little, like they're right here? <laughs> the little teeny eyeglasses. <clears throat> He was the Puritan minister of Boston, and he had himself portrayed here with his spectacles alongside his book to show that he was a man of learning, that he was a reader of scripture. That's the only reason the spectacles exist here. The spectacles uh, that Franklin wore came out of the age of, Newton, of Isaac Newton's optics, which inspired all kinds of thinking about what it meant to see. The Enlightenment is about seeing. It is about spectacle. John Donne observed that thou, when thou lookest through spectacles, small things seem great. Uh, spectacles made things bigger. Wearing them, thinking about lenses, also inspired a lot of reflection on the nature of the self, of sympathy, of moral imagination. John Locke wrote, I think we may as rationally hope to see with other men's eyes as to know by other men's understanding. What would it mean to see through someone else's eyes? Richard Steele, writing in the aptly named Spectator, wrote, man's eyes are spectacles to those who, see, who look at him to read his heart. Wearing spectacles then, being portrayed wearing spectacles, marked Benjamin Franklin as a man of discernment. They marked him as a prodigious reader which of course we know that he was. Benny read his Bible at five years old, Jane remembered about him. As a child, she said, he studied incessantly. He was addicted to all kinds of reading. Their father was a poor Boston Chandler, but he decided to send Benny, the only of his sons to send to school. He put his other sons to trades, but he would give this one son, one of his 10 sons, a tithe to the church, and he needed learning. So in 1714, when Jenny was two, and Benny was eight, he entered the Boston South Grammar School where he studied Latin and Greek. The idea was for him to go to Harvard and become a minister. But he spent only two years there before his father pulled him out and sent him to a cheaper school on Hanover Street in the North End. But then his father took him out of that school too to keep him at the shop. Boiling wax, making candles, and running errands. Did Jenny go to school? Jenny went to school not at all. Her parents could not easily have sent her to any school, even if they'd wanted to. No public school in Boston enrolled girls. Beginning in 1701, Massachusetts poor laws required teaching boys to write and girls to read. Boys held quills, girls held needles. In 1710, three in five women in New England could not even sign their names. Signing is mechanically, you would often learn to sign your name. It had nothing to do with learning to read but three in five women could not even sign their names. A Boston newspaper at the time printed a dialogue between a thriving tradesman, tradesman and his wife about the education of their daughter. The wife wishes to send the girl to school. The husband refuses, telling her, "Prithee, good madam, let her first be able to read a chapter truly in the Bible that she mayn't mispronounce God's people popel, nor read constable for Constantinople, Constantinople. Make her expert and ready at her prayers that God may keep her from the devil's snares. Teach her what's useful, how to shun deluding, to roast, to toast, to boil, and mix a pudding, to knit, to spin, to sew, to make or mend, to scrub, to rub, to earn, and not to spend. I tell thee, wife, once more, I'll have her bread to bookery, cookery, thimble, needle, and thread. I have to say, I was a Girl Scout, and I had a badge for like each one of these things. Does anyone have? 
This is the Girl Scout badge list. <laughs> Jane Franklin was bred to bookery, cookery, thimble, needle, and thread. She cut the wick and dipped the candles. She didn't go to school to come back to the shop. She was always at the shop. She boiled soap. She did the work her brother hated. Why would she ever need spectacles? Why did he send her those spectacles in 1771? Because Jane Franklin learned to read like most girls did. But she read more. She read avidly. She read passionately. And then she learned how to write because her brother taught her. Benjamin Franklin fought for his learning letter by letter, book by book, candle by candle. He valued nothing more, and he loved his little sister, his twin. It was cruel in its kindness because when he ran away, the lessons ended. In 1717, when Jenny was five, her older brother James set up a printing shop in Boston, around the corner. For Benny, it was a godsend. Here at last was a trade this bookish boy, too poor to go to Harvard, could undertake. The next year, he became his brother's apprentice. He moved into a room above James's shop. Benny was 12, Jenny was six. The best part of his apprenticeship, Benny always said, was the chance it gave him to read. He worked in a bookshop. <laughs> At home, he had only ever found in his father's libraries a few books he's, he liked, Plutarch's Lives, a book of Defoe's called An Essay on Projects, and another of Dr. Mather's called Essays to Do Good. Jenny read these books too. But working in a printer shop was almost as good uh, as living in a library. I had now had access to better books, Franklin remembered. He traded books with another bookish lad in town. They liked to stage formal debates as if they were university men, Harvard boys. The only debate he remembered well, though, later in life was the debate that the two boys had over the propriety of educating the female sex. Franklin's friend was of the opinion that it was improper and that girls were naturally unequal to it. Franklin, just for the sake of taking the opposite side, disagreed. I think he was thinking of Jane. In crafting his argument that girls maybe ought to be educated after all, Franklin leaned on Daniel Defoe's essay on projects. Defoe had proposed the idea of an academy for women. I have often thought it is one of the most barbarous customs in the world, he wrote, considering us as a civilized and Christian country that we deny the advantages of learning to women. Defoe regretted the frivolousness of girls' education. Their youth is spent to teach them to stitch and sew or make baubles. They're taught to read and eat and perhaps to write their names or so. And that is the height of a woman's education. He proposed founding an academy for women to embrace every subject to such whose genius would lead, lead them to it. I would deny no sort of learning. Benjamin Franklin didn't actually win this argument with his brother because he wasn't as good as arguing with his friend, because he wasn't as good as arguing as his friend was. But I like to think about what Jenny must have been doing when Benjamin was having that argument about whether girls ought to be educated. She was at home dipping candles, stitching. But quietly, with what time she could spare, she seems to have been doing more because she once confided to her brother, I read as much as I dare. In 1721, Jenny and Benny's brother, James, bought his first pair of spectacles in a shop in Boston. He was 24, and he also started printing a newspaper, the New England Current. Benjamin set the type and printed and delivered this newspaper. But what he wanted to do was write. So he disguised himself as a woman and submitted essays to his brother, his brother's newspaper under the pen name Silence do good, whose first submission was an essay about the importance of the lives of ordinary people. Silence Do Good was a, allegedly a woman writing newspaper articles. And so the first thing she had to do was explain how it is that she came by her learning. She had benefited, she explained, from an unusual upbringing. Her father, she had been born on a ship crossing from London to Boston, and her father, as he stood upon the deck rejoicing at her birth, had been swept away by a wave and drowned. Her mother, who had been too poor to keep her, had apprenticed her to a minister who happened to have rather liberal views about female education. He had read his Defoe. He endeavored that I might be instructed in all that knowledge and learning which is necessary for our sex and denied me no accomplishment that could be possibly attained in a country place, such as all sorts of needlework, writing, arithmetic. And observing that I took a more than ordinary delight in reading ingenious books, he gave me the free use of my library, which though it was small, yet it was well chosen, to inform the understanding rightly and enable the mind 
to frame great and noble ideas. Silence do good, she said, spent much of her childhood with the best of company, books. So think about that for a minute. This is the first time Benjamin Franklin breaks upon the literary stage. He takes the disguise of a woman whose girlhood was spent voraciously reading books. Benny was 16, Jenny was 10. Maybe he smuggled books to her from their brother books, brother's bookstore because Silence Do Good was Jane Franklin. Benjamin Franklin ran away from home the next year when he was 17, Jane was 11. Virginia Woolf once asked, what would have happened had Shakespeare had a wonderfully gifted sister called Judith? In this powerful essay of Woolf, she imagines this, this sister uh, for William Shakespeare, this Judith Shakespeare, and she imagines what would have been her fate. And Woolf, who herself struggled with, lim with her ambition in an age when women were not allowed to have ideas, imagined that this poor Judith Shakespeare would have been discouraged from learning, uh, and she would have run away from home in order to seek a wider ambit. She would, in fact, have run away in Virginia Woolf's imagining to the stage. Before she was out of her teens, she was betrothed to the son of a neighboring wool stapler. She cried out that marriage was hateful to her, and for that she was beaten by her father. Then he ceased to scold her. He begged her. She ran away, broke his heart, found herself pregnant, and predictably dies. She kills herself one winter's night. Because in Virginia Woolf's imagination, a woman who read, a woman who had ideas, a woman who had intellectual ambition, ambition simply could not survive. Judith Shakespeare is a figment of Virginia Woolf's imagination, a heroine trapped in a modern manly idea of the self and of the author of a self. Virginia Woolf could not imagine an author who was not unencumbered. The facts of Jane Franklin's life are hard to come by, but you don't need to make up a sister for Benjamin Franklin, who lives a childhood not unlike Judith Shakespeare's. She's not a figment of my imagination. She was flesh and blood and milk and tears. Her brother went away and broke their father's heart. She did not, because she never gave herself that much rope. She didn't kill herself one winter's night, because she never gave herself that kind of rope either. She had too many people to look after. I write now in my own little chamber and nobody in the house near to disturb me, she wrote, delighted. She was very happy to have it, but having that room of her own isn't why she didn't write more or sooner. After Benjamin Franklin ran away, he settled in Philadelphia, where he opened his own printing shop, like his brother. A revolution in eyewear had begun when the temple spectacle was invented. A temple spectacle has arms. If you're wearing eyeglasses, you have temple spectacles. They, too, have arms that go along your temples. Benjamin Franklin started selling temple spectacles at his shop in 1730, when he was 24, which is also when he began reading them, when he began wearing them. At first, he really just wore them for reading like everyone else, but then he started wearing them around town. And when he wore them around town, he noticed that they weren't as useful to wear around town as they were to sit at a desk and read with. I formerly had two pairs of spectacles, he wrote, which I shifted occasionally, as in traveling. I sometimes read and often wanted to regard the prospects. This is Franklin's story about how he invents bifocals. Be like, I, I had these reading glasses, and I would bring them with me when I went on a trip, and I'd be riding in a car, car carriage, and I'd bring a little book with me. I'd be sitting reading my little book in the carriage, and then I would want to look at the beautiful view, and I would look at the beautiful view, and I couldn't see anything. So I'd have to lift up my eyeglasses to look out the window, but then I'd have to put them back on, to, and it really got to bother me, and so I had this idea. I could just make these lenses that were split right across the middle, and this is Franklin's lovely story of, of inventing bifocals, which allow you to see things both up close and far away, things that are small and things that are large. And I came to think that this was a metaphor for how we ought to think about biography, or even how we ought to think about history. That is to say, we shouldn't be distracted by the large people with their large lives and their, and their great power. We should allow ourselves a set of tools that would allow us to see uh, the smaller lives, the ordinary lives. Few people's eyes are fellows. I think there's a lesson here about the writing of history, that historians need two different lenses, too. So I got really obsessed with this idea of binocular biography. It seemed to solve all kinds of problems to me. Um, and uh, I, I got really obsessed with the paucity of women who wore 
glasses at the time. You can look at portraits throughout New England of women in the 18th century, and you do sometimes see eyeglasses, because women who read a lot wanted to boast. This woman has her eyeglasses down here in her hand, boasting of her piety. She's a dedicated reader. Uh, this woman, too, she's a little more severe. She's got her glasses with her. She's a devoted, pious woman, uh, a dedicated reader. I always think of this as the Hillary Clinton of the 18th century with her I remember Clinton used to do that thing with her glasses up on her head. Um, so I got really, I just got really, really interested in this, and I felt like you, that a biographer really needed eyeglasses as a kind of a tool with which to do history. So I ordered these eyeglasses, which I, I normally take off, my glasses off and put these on and show you these. These are Jane Franklin style eyeglasses but I am sure I'm gonna lose my microphone if I do that. So I'm not gonna take them off. But I wanna point out that the glasses shop that I got these eyeglasses from has a really interesting motto. <laughs> I, found, I found this very discouraging. Like, there's just no escaping Benjamin Franklin. Can't they change it to Jane? Like, she had glasses too. Um, but I wanna ask you to think about, if you have glasses on, take them off for a minute and look around, and the world looks different to you, but do you feel different? I feel really different when I have my glasses off. I feel vulnerable and unprotected. I also feel blind. Um, I, feel, I feel seen in a way that I don't, I feel like I'm somehow suddenly undisguised. Um, and when you put your glasses on, you feel suddenly a capacity, um, a capacity for discernment, Maybe you feel that you're signaling that you are learned. Like there's all kinds of things that are vestigial for us about eyewear that date, date to the 18th century. And I, I want to ask that we think about eyeglasses as a special tool for looking at details of the past that we might otherwise not see. So when I said about writing the story of Jane Franklin some years back, I felt like what I did was put on a new pair of glasses, Jane Franklin's bifocals, so that I could think about the relationship, say, between Benjamin Franklin and Virginia Woolf. And when I looked at this pair of portraits wearing that eyewear, thinking this way, I realized this is the same portrait. <laughs> like, what? It's just compositionally, it's the same. Um, everything about this portrait, what, you're at your desk with your papers, you're signaling that you are a writer, you are a thinker, you're holding your head in your hands because your head is so weighted down with thoughts, your great big <laughs> giant brain. And you're alone, and there's no indication of any other human being in the world for you. You exist in a relationship with your books. And that is what the author wants you to see. This an author that is invented essentially by the likes of Franklin in the 18th century, a particular invention of the author as a solitary figure, a lonely figure, um, a, a contemplative single person. Um, this is not how Jane Franklin ever could have understood herself, but it helps me to see how it is that Benjamin Franklin could write the story of his life as if she did not exist. Well, so when Benjamin Franklin wrote this biography, this autobiography, he made manifest this vision of self in the story of his life. It is really just him all the way. <laughs> like a self-made man is a complete lie. I mean, everybody knows. <laughs> There, there are no self-made men. I'm sorry. I have three boys. Um, so what about Jane? Jane actually did write the story of her life. I found it, this little book of 16 pages, I found it. It's here in an archive in Boston. And I held it in my hands. Here's uh, a page from it. It is so small. It is so humble. And it is so plain. She called it her book of ages. It isn't really an autobiography. It's a list of the births and deaths of her children. It's a litany of grief. It is a record in brief of a life lived rags to rags. 16 pages, and as I turned them, I discovered that most of the pages were blank. You finally have a book. You have a pen. You have a long life. And she did not write much down. So why? Why not write the story of your own life? I nearly gave up on that biography at that point because I figured if you can't help me out here, lady, like I need a little, I need a little something. But holding those sheets of hand-stitched fool cap, fool's cap together, stitched with really coarse threads, and looking at that blank page, 
through Jane Franklin's spectacles, I began to think that maybe she did have something to say after all. And when I turned those pages again, I saw in Jane Franklin's Book of Ages an unwritten story, a history of books and paper, a history of reading and writing, a history of history, a book of ages, about ages of books. So I want to just tell you a little bit of that story, because so far I've really, you've noticed, been talking about Benjamin. But now I want to talk only about Jane. And I want to talk about this book, this little booklet. Her paper was made from rags, soaked and pulped and strained and dried. Her thread was made from flax, combed and spun and twisted and dyed. On a table, she laid down a sheet of fool's cap and smoothed it with the palms of her hands. She creased it and folded it and folded it again. She pressed it open. She used a needle to stitch a seam. It made the slimmest of volumes no thicker than a patch of burlap. She dipped the nub of a pen slit from the feather of a bird into a pot of ink boiled of oil mixed with soot. And then on the first page, she wrote three words. The handwriting is like anything she wrote anywhere else. A lavish calligraphic letter B, a graceful, slender, artful A. She wrote these three words and only these three words in a loopy, round hand that she would have taught herself from a writing manual, like the ones that her brother printed in Philadelphia that included directions to beginners, how to make a pen, how to hold a pen, instructions to write in a variety of hand, and for copying alphabets of the most unusual, fashionable, and commendable hands for business. She chose her words with care, book of ages, and then she turned the page. At the top of the next recto in a small, cramped hand, she began her chronicle. It starts as though she's writing the story of her life. Jane Franklin, born on March 27, 1712. Then below it, she wrote, Edward Meekham, married to Jane Franklin, the 27th of July, 1727. Book of Ages, her age, born 1712, married 1727. She was 15 years old. She was a child. The legal age for marriage in Massachusetts was 16. The average age was 24, which except for Jane is also the average age at which her sisters were married and the age at which Benjamin was married too. Edward Meekham, the man she married, was poor. He was a saddler. He was a Scot. He wore a wig and a beaver hat. He lived next door. She never once wrote anything about him expressing the least affection. She hardly ever wrote anything about him at all. Usually, if you married at 15 to the man next door who was many years older than you, who you never wrote anything of affection about, he had raped you, and you needed to marry him. She added another line. Josiah Meekham, their firstborn, on Wednesday, June the 4th, 1729. Another died May the 18th, 1730. The child of her childhood died three weeks shy of his first birthday. A dead child is a sight no more surprising than a broken pitcher, the Puritan minister Cotton Mather preached. One in four children in Boston in those years died before the age of 10. They were wrapped in linen dipped in melted wax while a box was made of pine, built and painted black. Puritans banned prayers for the dead at the grave, there would be no sermon, no ministers. There should be no tears. Weep not, ministers commanded. What remains of a life like Jane's firstborn son? Remains means what remains of the body after death, but remains are also your unpublished papers. Your descendants are your remains. Anne Bradstreet wrote about her children as my little babes, my dear remains. But Bradstreet's poems were her children too thou ill-formed offspring of my feeble brain. Her words that all, were all that her children would one day have left of her, she wrote. If chance to thine eyes shall bring this verse, she told them, kiss this paper. Jane Franklin didn't know how to write a poem. She couldn't have afforded a stone over there in the granary burying ground. She buried that baby and went home and wrote a book of remembrance, kiss this paper. In 1733, Jane turned 21, it was a big birthday, and her brother sent her a gift, the gift of a book, the Lady's Library in three volumes. She wrote on the inside, Jane Meekham, her book given her by her brother, Benjamin Franklin, 1733, for her birthday. Franklin had founded the first lending library in America, in Philadelphia, two years before. Jane knew something about libraries too. She inscribed her uh, copies of her books uh, with her name, and if she lent them out to anyone, 
she made sure to get them back. Jane Franklin spent her adult life reading and bearing and losing children. She gave birth to 12 children in 24 years. Her husband fell into debt. He seems to have gone mad. Two of her sons became violently insane and had to be locked up. She gave birth to 12 children in 24 years and buried 10 of them. Sorrows roll upon me like the waves upon the sea, she once wrote. I am hardly allowed, allowed time to fetch my breath. I am broken with breach upon breach. She begged God, what have I more? She found comfort in the books that she read, including this book, Her Brother's Experiments on Electricity. She wrote her name on it. She begged her brother for more of his books, for more of his essays. I keep your books of philosophy and politics by me, and when I am dull, I take one up and read, and it is like I am conversing with you or hearing from you. I take a pleasure in that. She needed those spectacles in 1771 because she read as much as she dared. She read all the time. By 1771, that year that Jane got her pair of glasses, Massachusetts, for the first time, required that girls be taught to write. It was a revolutionary idea. But support for the education of girls grew in Massachusetts and the rest of New England after the Revolution. With the rise in women's education came a rise in female ownership of glasses. All of those portraits I showed you of women holding glasses come from after the American Revolution. It's a part of the revolution we don't celebrate, the, but the American Revolution was a revolution in female education. In the company of books, in the company of her own mind, Jane Franklin found wisdom. The revolution in Boston made her a radical, but a different kind of a radical than it made her brother. I just want to tell you one story about Jane's life after the revolution. She moved to a little house in the North End that her brother had bought for her. She loved it there. In 1786, living in that little house in the North End, she read a book by, called Four Dissertations, written by Richard Price, a Welsh clergyman and political radical. One objection to the idea that everything in life is fated by providence, Price wrote, is the failure to thrive. Many perish in the womb, and even more are nipped in the bloom, he wrote. An elm produces 300,000 seeds a year, but very few of those seeds grow to trees. A spider lays 600 eggs, and yet very few grow into spiders. So too for humans. Thousands of Boyles, Clarks, and Newtons have probably been lost to the world and lived and died in ignorance and meanness merely for want of being placed in favorable situations and enjoying favorable advantages. At her desk, with Price's four dissertations pressed open, with her spectacles resting on her nose, Jane wrote a letter to her brother and reported what she had read. Then she added an opinion of her own. Very few we know is able to beat through all impediments and arrive to any great degree of superiority and understanding. Benjamin Franklin knew and his sister knew that very few ever beat through the obstacles of the 18th century world. 300,000 seeds to make one elm, 600 eggs to make one spider. Of the 17 children of the Boston candle maker Josiah Franklin, how many broke through? Very few, nearly none. Only one, we usually think, but I think two. Jane Franklin died in 1794. What remains of her life? Her Book of Ages is here in an archive in Boston, saved wonderfully. Her spectacles do not survive. Of the hundreds and hundreds of letters she wrote to her brother, more than half have been lost. He probably threw them away. Her gravestone was rolled over in 1827 to make the Franklin monument that was built the same year as the Bunker Hill Monument. You cannot find her grave anymore. And her house was demolished in 1939 to improve the view of the statue of Paul Revere in the North End. I just have one coda uh, about this story of Jane Franklin and the lessons that I learned from it that have to do with the lessons I've learned from the readers of the book I wrote about Jane Franklin that came out so many years ago now. Um, <clears throat> it has to look to do not with Jane, but with one other woman. Most people, when I showed you all those portraits of Benjamin Franklin when we started, and most people when they think about Benjamin Franklin actually think about this image um, because it's on the, is it the 100? On the $100 bill. Um, 
Franklin is very well remembered for this image, which is uh, an engraving based on a portrait that's held in the National Portrait Gallery. And it weirdly doesn't show him with spectacles. It was not among his favorite portraits of himself. And we think about Franklin uh, and his many legacies. Franklin is often thought of as a kind of prophet of capitalism. This is a, a much later construction of Franklin's life when Franklin was, if anything, a prophet of charity. Uh, he sent Jane Firewood every winter here in Boston to get her through the winter of Boston's time. Um, but we, of course, very much remember Franklin for his role at the Constitutional Convention, where when things fr fell apart, the elderly Franklin, the elderly statesman, really held the meeting together. Uh, as you know, at the Constitutional Convention, the delegates had to take an oath of secrecy. So when the convention convened uh, in, in May of 1787, Benjamin Franklin wrote his, the last letter he wrote before the sequestering, he wrote to Jane in Boston. And when the convention, convention ended, the first letter he wrote was to Jane. The same had been the case every time he had been sequestered as he gathered with these men. But Jane had wanted to write a letter to him. And she did. Uh, this is this letter here that she wrote to Franklin right before um, the, con the Constitutional Convention began. I hope with the assistance of such a number of wise men as you are connected with at the convention, let me just say that's sarcastic. <laughs> you have to hear that is like, oh my God, what are you up to? I hope with the assistance of such a number of wise men you will have it connected within the convention that you will gloriously accomplish and put a stop to the necessity of dragooning and haltering, their odious means. I had rather hear the swords being torn into turned to plowshares and the halters used for cart ropes, if by that means we may be brought to live peaceably with one another. It's a little bit hard to parse, but what Jane Franklin, who had been through the revolution in Boston, who had seen soldiers beating women on the streets, who had seen the Sons of Liberty burning and tarring loyalists, who had seen the terrible violence and often the wanton malice of the revolution, which was essentially a civil war here in Boston, had no use for violence. She had no use for guns. She had no use for weapons. She had no use for dragooning people into service. She was asking Franklin to accomplish at the Constitutional Convention a set of political reforms that we would associate with, say, nonviolence. She did not have any voice at that convention, and Franklin did not speak on her behalf. But I think we, as the descendants of these people, politically, as the we the people that we are, have an obligation to hear the voices of people who were not represented at the Constitutional Convention, have an obligation to even, in fact, think of our Constitution with regard to what people who were not enfranchised at the time of the ratification of the Constitution thought about it. And that is why I think this story is so important, and even why I think think the ART's uh, revival of 1776 is important because we can take these stories and we can think more broadly about them and we can stand on the shoulders of all the incredible research that has been done over the last decades into the lives of people who are not the 55 delegates to the Constitutional Convention but all the people that fed them and cared for them and raised them <coughs> and wrote to them, many of them, disagreeing with what they were doing there. I received, um, some time after my book came out, I put a plea in the book for anyone who had documents relating to Jane Franklin, and I actually have received a fair number, but nothing was so moving to me as this photograph, which is Jane Franklin's great-granddaughter, Dolly, who grew up in Lancaster. And I want to just end with this image, uh, because I think you can see here, it's unfortunate for Dolly, but she greatly resembles <laughs> Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> <laughs> and I think is pretty much what Jane, people always remarked how, how like they were physically, how they really were like twins. Now you can see that Dolly didn't have good dental care, she doesn't have any teeth, and Franklin would have had fake teeth, and uh, he, he would have looked different uh, facially because of that. But in all other ways, the likeness is, I think, quite profound. Um, I've spent a lot of time uh, talking about this book over the years, or some years ago, I, I did. And I always tell the story, I start with Benjamin Franklin and I move to the story of Jane Franklin and I always identify her as Benjamin Franklin's sister. And then when I look at this picture of Dolly, the more I look at this picture of Dolly, the more I think, I think we just really just need to talk about Jane. And that's what I hope that this upcoming produ production of 1776 allows all of us to do. Thank you.
ever tempted to go to Philadelphia with Ben? Uh, yeah, I did. Were people able to hear that? Or is it? Okay, the question was, was Jane ever tempted to go to Philadelphia with Ben? Um, she did. So, uh, as you may know, the British occupied Boston during the American Revolution, and when the uh, people of Boston were evacuating in anticipation of the, um, the, the occupation, Jane tried to get together her two grandchildren, who the, who the people who were in her charge, and leave Boston with them. She was only able to, to find her granddaughter, but she left Boston and went to Cambridge. Franklin had just come back from London on a diplomatic mission, and uh, Congress had decided to send George Washington to Cambridge to take command of the Continental Army. And he, they wanted someone to go with him. And Benjamin Franklin said, I'll go, because he needed to go get Jane, because he had heard that she, she had fled Boston and was in Cambridge. So he took a carriage up to Boston and picked her up and brought her down to Philadelphia. And she spent a good part of the war in Philadelphia with Franklin. And she didn't really get along. She was a tough cookie. She didn't really get along with it. She ended up going to Rhode Island for much of the year. But so she wasn't very well traveled, but she had spent some time in, in Philadelphia. He, he always kept saying, why don't you just move to Philadelphia and then we can be together. And she would say, no, 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 no. And then he writes this letter and he says, old people are like turtles. You just can't take them out of their shells. I, I, well, first of all, just thank you so much. This was just so spectacular. And it's just a very quick comment. I lived in um, Sao Paulo, Brazil, which would have been like living in New York in the early 80s. And I showed up with my glasses and was immediately told, you got to lose them. Huh. And, and it was the whole, and it was the whole idea. Sorry. <laughs> And, and it was this whole idea of um, you're not going to be able to get a man. People are not going to want to hang out. Yeah, I mean, it, yeah. it was you look too bookish. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and I wish I could remember exactly what there was a phrase that was used. And it was something like, women who know Latin neither get a husband or come to a good end. <laughs> and um, so anyway, I, it, it, you know, spectacles still have yeah. a resonance in yeah, place. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So anyway, thank right. you so much. Yeah. I was just so struck Thanks for by that it. story. That's wonderful. Hi, I was wondering how long was she married? If her husband was older than her. Yeah, um, she married in, what did I say, 1727? And he died in 1765. Um, yeah, and he was mad at the end. Um, it was kind of a tough year because it was the, the Stamp Act year and the Stamp Act riots. And the, she really wanted help from Thomas Hutchinson, who was the lieutenant governor, who was despised by the Stamp Act rebels. And, but she, she went to him for help, and she and her brother had a big fight about this. And yeah, I have endless trivial details I can tell you. <laughs> yeah, they, <laughs> no, they had a long marriage, but I, I think it was horrible. I was wondering how long it took you to do research on all of this to publish your book. Um, I wish I could remember. So, so I, the reason I'm a historian is because I can't remember anything and I have to write everything down. <laughs> so I'm sympathetic with an archive. Um, I, I once wrote an essay about why I wrote this book. I wrote an essay in The New Yorker called The Prodigal Daughter. Um, I came across the story of, it was about how it took me too long to write the book because I was writing it for my mother and she died before I finished it. Um, so that's what the essay is about, but I, I at some point went to Widener Library at Harvard because I was going to write an essay about Benjamin Franklin, and that would have been 2008. And I remember the bound papers of Benjamin Franklin, Benjamin Franklin's writings are an incredible editorial project that comes out of Yale. They were working on it since the 1950s, and they're still not done gathering and editing and annotating and printing his papers. But I spent, you know, like a good couple days just sitting on the floor of the stacks and taking volume after volume and reading his papers from beginning to end, which is the thing I really like to do. And I remember just thinking, I'm just sitting there flipping the pages. Every other letter was from Jane. And every other letter of his was to Jane. And I just said, who the hell is this Jane Franklin? Why have I never heard of her before? And I thought about all the biographers who had been through Franklin's papers 
and hadn't, I mean, there's this actually, Carl Van Doren wrote this quite lovely book about Jane Franklin in 1950, because he felt out of a sense of, he, he had run a Pulitzer Prize for a beautiful biography of Franklin, and he felt so guilty about not writing about Jane that he then wrote a biography of Jane that no one ever read and didn't win any prizes, so I'm very sympathetic with Carl Van Doren about that. <laughs> um, but I, at, when, I, when I went through the Franklin papers, I was like, I really should write this book. And I, told, I remember sitting in my kitchen table visiting my mother and telling her that story. And she said, honey, you really have to write that book? You have to write. My mother really identified with Jane. And, um, and then I didn't, I didn't, I kept putting it off. I put it off for years and years and years. I, so I, pr I probably didn't start until like 2011. The book came out in 2013. Probably took me a year, a year of really dedicated research. And writing is very fast for me. So um, maybe, I don't know, maybe it was a couple of years. Not longer than that. The Langdon Clow or Clow Langdon House, which is across the street. Yeah. Have you, you must have gone to that. Yeah. Is that that's open as a museum. I think in your book you mentioned that it was a very similar house to the one that Jane grew up in. Was that true? And the, one more other question yep. is, um, oh, her book. I know you saw it. Um, are you the only person who can look at it? Or is it, can others see it? Is there a way oh, of seeing it? Oh, you should go it? see it. I you would love to. Where, where is it? It's at the, um, well, the New England Historical and Genealogical Society Archives, which might have a different title now. Does is that on Boylston Street? Yeah. Um, they've also digitized it. You could see it online. But the Clow House, it's a great question. So um, the house that Jane lived in after the Revolution in the North End was built by, I think it's Eliza Clow. Um, and he's also the brick, he's a, he was a mason. It's a little brick house. And he was the mason who built the North Church. And he had a house next door. And he, there was a, his house is, is like, a, like a full Georgian house with like a door in the middle and then the two windows on either side. And next door he built a half house, a twin house that was a half house. It's actually kind of brutally like a good metaphor for Benjamin and Jane. But that her house was a half of a house. It was just like a door and two windows, like literally a half house. So it was like one room up and one room, like two rooms on the first floor and two rooms on the second floor. And um, it's that house that was demolished in 1939 to improve the view so that you could get the postcard. You know the postcard view where you can see the equestrian statue of Revere, who was a nobody. I'm sorry. <laughs> and then you see the North Church in the background. Like Jane Meekham's obituary was longer than Paul Revere's obituary in the Boston Gazette when she died. Anyway, it was to make this picture postcard view better. So if you go to the cloth, it's exactly the same house but just half as big. Um, and I, I talked to the people at the wonderful people at the Old North Church to ask them if they would consider making his house, the Jane Franklin House Museum, because we, know, we have a complete probate inventory of her house when she died. We know everything that was in it. Um, she, she's a really quite fascinating person, really illuminating life about life in Boston. She wrote this incredibly, she had these hilarious letters to her brother where she's an old lady and she's like I've been out painting the front door because I don't want anybody coming by and looking for Mr. Franklin's for Dr. Franklin's sister and have my door look raggedy <laughs> <laughs> like she's just funny like it, it would be a great little museum um but they're doing something else with it right now hi hi um I have a question just about like um, it sounds like she was very close with her brother, obviously, um, but what sort of opportunities were there for like female camaraderie at this time? Was she interacting with other women or was she pretty much just confined to her own household and her own children and her husband? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. We know a lot about that from other women. So, um, a lot of the way that I worked in this book was to, um, where I didn't know a lot about, specifically about something that was in Jane's life that I really want to know more about. I would figure out what historians know about women in general who were like Jane. Um, she did have really close female friends that she writes about a lot. She, she stays in Rhode Island with this woman, Catherine Green, and she just loves Katie and talks about her all the time. She has a cousin named Grace Williams, who she loves, and I think that Grace gets breast cancer. Um, she's really close to her sisters. Uh, all her sisters die, all die. Be the, the, the Benjamin and Jane are the last two Franklins to live. They, she's the last one to die, and he's the second to last one to die. Um, but they, she's close to their siblings all long before they die. <laughs> she was really close to, really close to her mother. Um, she has, um, the Franklins, Benjamin Franklin and Jane Franklin's mother, um, came from, uh, Nantucket. 
and Jane goes out to Nantucket to visit uh, her cousins there fairly often, and they come and stay with her in Boston. Her cousin's daughter comes and live with, lives with her for a while. Her granddaughter lives with her. So she really does live in a, a very much of a female world, um, and that, that, would have been, that would have been pretty common. It's, it's one of the things that makes her so vulnerable, because there's no one bringing in money. She, um, What's male about her world is during, in the 1760s, in 1766, right after her husband dies, she starts taking in boarders. She makes her house into a boarding house. And then the people that board in her house are the Massachusetts assemblymen. And so they're all the like, they're all like the sons of liberty are hanging out at her house. So her brother's like, what are they saying at the table? So she, <laughs> she I got, here I am typing. Yeah, she sends them on her laptop, an email. <laughs> She sends him letters <laughs> uh, reporting on, on these guys. Like, she's a good listener. And she keeps, he keeps asking, what do you think? She's like, well, I like to listen to politics, but I don't like to say. <laughs> so, um, yeah, she has all of her relationships with men are super hierarchical. Like, she's serving them or, you know. Uh, but with women, she, she does have these quite deep friendships. I think you said that Jane had 12 children and Barry 10. Yeah. What is known about the two who survived? And I'm wondering what is known about Dolly? Yeah, uh, yeah, thank you. That's great. Um, I actually think she had 13 children, but I was never able to prove it, so I always say 12. But um, I do think she, was, she married that guy because she was pregnant and then probably had a stillborn child. And there was, there's no um, church rec record or parish record of, the, of that first child. Um, the two that survived her, now I'm going to have a hard time remembering. The main, her, her nephew, her son, Benny, moved to Philadelphia and became a printer. He was the most successful of her children before he went mad and then had to be like locked up in a barn for the rest of his life. Um, but I think he was still alive at the time of her death. He had just sort of disappeared. But he shows up in Benjamin Franklin's will. Or, like there, there's suggestions that he was still alive, not um, competent, but still around. But he and his wife had four children together. And um, a daughter of hers who had a daughter lived with her for a very, very, very long time. And then in her old age, only the, only the granddaughter lived. So um, Dolly, flag is the child of Jane had a daughter named Sally who married a man named flag who had a boy and Sally had a boy named Josiah who fell down the stairs at Jane's house and became lame for the rest of his life but moved to Lemons moved to Lancaster Josiah flag and married a woman in Lancaster and had Dolly and Jane held Dolly in her arms before she died because she writes about how 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 much she looks like a Franklin <laughs> I mean, I don't you just feel bad for Dolly? <laughs> um, but the weird thing about Dolly is, I was checking my email one day, and I got, opened up an email, and this big picture of Dolly popped up. And I was like, who is this girl, Benjamin Franklin, <laughs> in my inbox? <laughs> and it was an email from, you're not even going to believe this, where I grew, I grew up in a one town over from Lancaster where Jane's descendants went, and where actually all of her books went. Josiah Flagg inherited her library. So the Lancaster Library owns a bunch of Jane's books. Um, and the portrait of Josiah and of, Jane, and of Jane's granddaughter, Jane. Um, when I was a kid, I had a newspaper route, and a, a woman wrote to me and she said, you used to deliver the newspaper when you were a kid, and it turns out I'm the descendant of Dolly Flagg, and I have a book in my house called The Book of My Ancestors. And I think this might be your Dolly flag. So it was like all those years I was delivering the newspaper. I could have just picked up that book. <laughs> but it was a very Ben Franklin story, you know? Who was Jane reading that informed her views in that last letter that we, you read to us about her views on nonviolence? Yeah. So. Um, there is this really cool thing that happened in 1778 when, um, you know how everything is named Franklin now? I grew up on Franklin Street, I'm just going to confess. Um, I should have used that detail in my last anecdote. Um, 
Franklin is, I think, maybe the most common town name in the United States. It's one of the most common town names. Um, but the very first town to be named Franklin, after Benjamin Franklin, was so named in 1778, and Massachusetts. And the people of Franklin, Massachusetts, wrote a letter to Benjamin Franklin. I don't know where he was then. Maybe he was in London. Probably he was in Paris, you know, doing what he was doing in Paris. <laughs> and, um, and said, we, uh, they want some money. <laughs> And they, they wanted to let him know they were naming a town in his honor, and it was a subtle way of saying, could you send us some money? We're building a, you know, we're building a church. We're starting this new town. And he um, wrote them back and said, well, I, I could give you money to, to, for a church bill, but a town like yours will surely need a library, and I will endow you with a library. And then he wrote to Jane and said, people in this town of Franklin want a library, but you're the one who should tell them what books they should have. And he also wrote to Richard Price, who wrote those four dissertations, who was a friend of his. So Richard Price sent in a list, and then, but then Jane made a list of the books, and those are the books that are the Benjamin Franklin collection at the Franklin, Massachusetts Town Library. They're the books that Jane recommended. And the sad thing was, I mean, it's an, if you've ever been out there, it's an adorable town, and it's an adorable library, and I went out there, and they have the Benjamin Franklin Library, the, this collection of 18th century rare books, in a beautiful case and it's locked up and they wouldn't unlock it. And I was like, what, it's Benjamin Franklin's books? Like, <laughs> I'm a scholar, I can see why not. Everybody, let me just look at them, I was so mad. I thought, like, I think there's probably annotations of hers. I think they were her, like, I think, you know. So it's very sad. <laughs> I was still mad about that. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't answer how she came to believe in equality and how she came to believe in nonviolence. She was a super devout Christian. And she, her belief in equality was both a Christian spiritual equality, kind of that deep, you know, we're all equal in the eyes of God, men and women, all colors. Um, but it was also a politically radical ideal of equality, a kind of Thomas Paine-ism. I don't know that I've ever seen her, she didn't, quote from Spain, but she really did read everything. She read the newspaper really regularly. She would have read Paine. Um, so, and she, she read a lot of English philosophy. She, a lot of women read novels then, and she, I've only ever found her evidence that she ever read one novel. She read political philosophy, is what she mainly read. I mean, she read the Bible, um, but she also had a real crisis of faith. The year that I think four of her children and three of her grandchildren and her husband all died, she stopped writing in that book of ages. She was like, you know what? F it, you know? <laughs> like, I'm done. I give up. And she wrote, her, wrote Franklin a letter. He, Franklin was basically an atheist at that point, but he, he knew she was, that her religion really mattered, and he, she wrote him a letter. He's like, I just can't. I have no faith anymore. And he said, you should get your faith back. I mean, and she did, but she, had, she, had, she struggled. She struggled given her suffering with her Christianity. I was wondering if you could tell us how easily accessible her voice was. You talk about her sarcasm, that we need to find that. When you read her letters, is she accessible to a modern audience? Do you get her tone? Can you, do you get a sense of her as a person? Yeah, that's a great question. I, um, the, the question was, how do you hear her voice? Like, can you, you know, 18th century prose is complicated. Like, how inscrutable is she? How can you tell that she's being sarcastic? It, do, it took a lot of work, and um, what's tricky about Jane is that although she's born in 1712, the first thing in her handwriting as a letter that survives is from 1758. So, how many years is that? 47. I mean, you're pretty much already been through most of your, I mean, most people were dead by 47. So, um, it's, it, that early part of her life is really complicated to chronicle, and I wrote a whole appendix about how I dealt with that as an evidentiary problem. But the letter from, um, oh, the letter before that, that she's in at all, is her mother's writing to, because it, it was her mother was trying to write a letter to Benjamin, and then Jane takes over and she says, you know, our mother is too ill to write, so I will take down what she says, and like, this is a passing of the pen. Um, but the letter from 1758, what I did in the book was I, um, 
I, sh I think I even have an illustration of the actual, you know, the letter itself, and then my transcription of it in Jane's spelling. And then I translate it into modern English because it's really hard to read because it's like one long sentence and all the sentence, all the words are spelled wrong. Um, <laughs> but I, if, I had, if, if I had a copy of the book, I could read it to you. But it's kind of hilarious because it's like, <laughs> it's from 1758, and she says, I'm going to give you my rendition of what this letter says. This is my performance of Jane Franklin. She says, My dear brother, or so I should not call you that, but maybe I should call you something else because I hear from, I heard from Cousin Betty, who heard from my doctor, who heard from his cousin, Jane, and who also told me that you are becoming a baron, that you are accepting a baronetcy, and if you are so superior to me that you are accepting a baronetcy, I'm not sure if I should still be writing to you because I have a lot of laundry to do. Your humble servant, Jane. <laughs> Like, so it's, it's like that. It's very, um, it's very miffy. And he always says to her, it is a family disposition of ours that we are sometimes a little miffy. And <laughs> so is she. Okay, so one last question. I had a, I'm, I'm thinking of this book in sort of the um, continuum of your work. Um, and it was published in 2014, was it? And... And you published tr these truths in 2018. And I'm wondering if over that time period and thinking of you today, opening this book again and looking at it, do you, through your five years, four years of experience, um, between those books or even up till now, two years after the publication of these truths, do you look back at parts of it and say, gosh, I got that wrong or I wish I'd said that or, I really prefer, I prefer now the interpretation of X. I'm just wondering how, how what you think about this book at this point. I think point. you think I have a lot more humility than I have. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm full of regrets. Get me the papers. Um, no, I totally sincerely take that question. And there's plenty of books that I do, you know, I, I would do differently now or I have different thoughts about. And maybe I just don't have enough distance from this book. My Jane Franklin book is the book that, of everything I've written, and I have actually written a lot of books, the book that I'm most proud of, um, and that I, like, love. I, like, I love, I love her story, um, and it is the book that I was most disappointed by, because, um, and it is the book that led me to write these truths. So that's the answer to the question. So when I wrote this book about Jane Franklin, and you heard some paragraphs of it here, because I read out loud from some pieces of the book, I thought what I was doing was, you know, Martin Luther with his 14 points nailed to the d church door or something. I mean, no, I didn't think I was Martin Luther, but like I thought I was like laying down a manifesto that said, everything you think you know about history is wrong because one half the world doesn't know how the other half lives. And until we have a better history, you don't know anything. Like we don't know anything. Like this is a book about history. And it was an indictment of everything, uh, every way in which history is taught in, uh, not every way, but what it, I really meant it, it was a super ambitious book, I thought, intellectually super ambitious. Although the book is meant to be read, it's very lyrically written, because it has a lot of literary ambition. And what I found was that um, it was received as, oh, a girl wrote a book about a girl, it's cute, let's put it on the back table. Like, even my publisher sent me a book jacket that was like, a, a cameo silhouette of, of an old grandma with a mob cap in a rocking chair knitting. And I was like, what are you smoking? Because I wrote like the, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire here. Like I thought it was so ambitious. And it wasn't everybody else's fault. It was that my sense of what people could receive as ambitious from a female writer was wrong. Like, I, I could have written 20 pages about John Adams and it would have been a gene work of unfounded genius. Like, it just is about your subject and who you are in the publishing industry. This is, I'm sorry, this should be off the record, but I, it is how I feel. And people would be like, well, <clears throat> are you going to get any blurbs by men? Because if your blurbs are by women, we really can't sell the book. You know, like, it was like that. <laughs> so I was so disappointed that people received it as a little book about a little woman by a little person, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> like it was a minor work that I thought, okay, if people can't recognize this is an ambitious work, 
what's the most ambitious thing I could do? <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you.